heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full earnings coverage. Ahead of shares of Spotify and Palantir, they surge on strong results. Details to come. Plus, strategists from Citibank warn positioning in technology stocks is so bullish that any sell-off in the sector could spark a market route. We'll break down the report. And Adam Newman and other investors, they're exploring an offer to buy WeWork out of bankruptcy. We'll bring you the latest reporting on the matter. But first, let's check in on these markets because it's a macro story. It's after the sell-off, significant sell-off in the bond market. We see just a little bit of calmness as we anticipate, of course, a lot of Fed speak to come. We're off by about tenth of a percent on the Nasdaq more broadly. Ten-year yield down five basis points after having risen and risen fast in the last two trading days. But I look at what's happening in China. This really is the story of a global nature today, Ed. We see, of course, the talk that Xi Jinping at the very top hierarchy chain of China is starting to debate what to do about the route, the sell-off that continues to afflict some of the Chinese stocks. And therefore, some of the internet names do well today. Trading of Chinese stocks up some 5% when you're looking at the Nasdaq Golden Dragon today. We're up 5.4%. Moving on, let's have a look at what's happening in the world of crypto. We're up more than 2%. In fact, sort of outperforming the rest of the tech names of the day. We're currently trading at 43,000. What have you got on the micro? Uh, this is an AI story and this is Palantir. The shares actually off session highs where they were up 30%, but on track for their biggest jump since May. Net income of $210 million in the year just gone. Their first full annual profit ahead of expectations. And what Palantir is saying is that for full year 24, operating income will be up to $850 million, way above what the street thought that they could do. The story, unbelievable demand for AI products. In fact, so great is the demand Palantir CEO Dr. Alex Karp told Bloomberg last night that they can't cope. They don't know what to do about all of the incoming for their AI platform. A really big move to the upside in that stock. We'll get deeper in that with our analysts in just a moment. Spotify is interesting. Before the bell, this is a global name of a lot of US investors. It is on track for its biggest jump since October. Uh, 236 million subscribers, a 1 million beat against what the street was expecting. But I, I kind of reflect on the last few weeks of shows, Caro, and we've been talking a lot about the difficulty in the streaming landscape, all the changes that are happening. They're still seeing growth and the streets cheering it. Let's get more on the details with Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw, who leads our screen time vertical. And is, is this just about the subscriber beat, the premium subscriber beat? I think it's that they beat on everything. You know, oftentimes when Spotify has earnings, they, they've delivered consistent user growth, really, for, for years. But there was oh, there's always something, it feels like, that investors can nitpick. The margins are a little off. The revenue is a little off. The, the forecast is a little off. This time, they really beat across the board. You know, they're growing faster than they've ever grown, which is pretty impressive for a you know, 15, 16-year-old company. They're doing it with free users. They're doing it with paid users. And the margins are starting to get a little bit better. You know, it's still an unprofitable company, not great. Uh, but between raising prices, cutting costs, and cutting back on some of the expenditures, it's looking like a better business to most investors. And those expenditures were people, Lucas, an awful lot of people that went more broadly. Where then do we think that the area of focus is at the moment for Spotify? Because they pull back on podcasting, but then they, well, more than 200 million is going for Joe Rogan to remain. How are you seeing the company continuing to innovate? Well, when I brought up expenditures, you're right, you know, I, I probably should have been a little more caring when it comes to how many people they cut. I was actually thinking more about the kind of the shift in the programming strategy. You, you know, you brought up Rogan. It's important to note that that podcast will no longer be exclusive to Spotify. And that's part of a real shift in strategy where they've taken shows. You know, they went in first with, with podcasting and got a lot of exclusive rights to shows by a lot of companies. Did that sort of amass the audience and bring podcast listeners on to the platform? Now that they have people there, they're more than happy to take those shows wide. And so Alex Cooper's show, Call Her Daddy, and Joe Rogan, they can be anywhere. Spotify just wants the ability to sell ads, distribute the shows, and then to your point about you know kind of what is next and big, they're making a big push into audiobooks. 
Well, that, that's what caught my eye. It's a bright spot for the company, and they kind of trialed the giveaway, right? So in some markets, they would say, have a few audiobooks on us. And now they're kind of solidifying that, that strategy. But it's also like a cultural moment. Like, audiobooks are in now. This is great for Spotify. Yeah, look, Audible has been the dominant player in audiobooks for basically as long as audiobooks have, have existed. Uh, but Spotify sees an opportunity there, much like they did in podcasting, where Apple was the dominant player, hadn't really innovated all that much. Um, and because there are already hundreds of millions of people who use Spotify to listen to music, they figured it would be pretty easy to convert them into doing some other type of audio behavior. That being podcasting, that has worked at least from an audience perspective. You know, Spotify is probably the number one podcast platform in the world, maybe number two. Depends how you want to classify YouTube and Apple. Uh, in, in audiobooks, it's, it's a tougher slog. Audible is not quite as, as lazy, I would say, as Apple has been in podcasting. Um, but Spotify does have a much larger customer base that's just coming in every day to, to listen to stuff. Lucas, always great to catch up and check out your wall art. It's always some of the best. Lucas Shaw, we appreciate him on all things Spotify. Meanwhile, let's turn to another phenomenal mover. As Ed was just pointing out, Palantir absolutely thriving on the day, up almost 21%. They gave higher than expected profit outlook for 2024. AI demand drives sales. It's off the charts. Mandeep Singh is here from Bloomberg Intelligence. Dan Ives making us laugh, saying it's the Messi of the reports when it comes to AI, and he means Leo Messi when it comes to the absolute stutter of a soccer player. How are they not able to keep up with demand? Who is coming with the demand? I mean, clearly the LLM wave that we have seen over the last 12 months is a nice tailwind for them. And what Palantir has is a visualization software that helps you leverage AI and also use it. So what companies are struggling with right now is, you know, they are looking to train their LLMs and then deploy it on the field. He, he quipped about, you know, how chatbot is not such a great interface, you know, to interact with an LLM. And, and they do have, you know, visualization software that is being used for defense purposes, mm. healthcare customers. So I think from a vertical AI strategy, uh, they do have something unique. And think of it as a co-pilot. Everyone right now is trying to deploy a co-pilot. I think Palantir solution will resonate for certain verticals, and that's what they called out yesterday with the U.S. commercial customers, because traditionally they have been heavy on the government side, mm. but actually they are now adding new customers on the commercial side, which is what I think the market is excited about. And this is what Dr. Alex Karp told us in an interview last night, that the focus essentially is building out that commercial business. Our commercial business is exploding in a way we don't know how to handle, we don't know what to do with the onslaught of demand. But Mandeep and Caro, I'm just, just humor me on this one. I'm just gonna go back a few years pre-IPO where Palantir didn't care about salespeople. They weren't really worried about onboarding customers, or any of that stuff. In fact, they ridiculed the idea of salespeople. They just wanted to do their own thing. Now, Dr. Karp's basically saying, uh-oh, we need some sales reps and some sales engineers and we need to be able to give this to customers. Are, are, you, are you convinced, Mandeep, they can actually do that, make a business of it? Yeah, look, they have a very different uh, selling motion. So compare them to hyperscalers. What Microsoft is doing with OpenAI, really setting infrastructure and then OpenAI providing the LLM and making it easy to train your own model. Palantir's solution is more out of the box. If you have geospatial data, you can use their platform and it offers something unique, but I don't think it applies to all sorts of enterprises. And that's where you know having a sales force could help, but we also know the customer acquisition costs go up when you have a direct sales force model. So to me, the competitive dynamics are between you know the likes of Palantir and Snowflake or Databricks that also compete in the same space but they leverage the public cloud more than Palantir does, which is more on-prem. So it's really about enterprises doing on-prem versus leveraging the public cloud here. What's interesting is he's pulling employees out of Europe at the moment. Germany, France, he just thinks that in the moment the demand isn't there. He thinks Europe's sort of not taking part in this AI wave. Are you seeing that, regionally speaking? 
Well, so I, I think it makes intuitive sense uh, because uh, Europe is probably behind when it comes to leveraging LLMs or customizing LLMs. So from that perspective, even though there are startups like Mistral over there, mm. you don't see companies being at the cutting edge of deploying these LLMs. So one could argue that right now the market is not ripe for deploying them. They just don't want to use a US company. That's that's also, I mean, Palantir is controversial. We, we know that. And, you know, the fact that they've been so vocal about, you know, everything they do uh, with regards to the Middle East conflict. And, and that has actually helped their international business. But not every commercial company wants to engage with, you know, a company like Palantir that clearly has very vocal views. And uh, that could go against you, you know, sometimes when you're trying to sell software. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. Great to have your analysis. Let's just talk about technology's impact on the broader market right now. Because City out with a really interesting note, warning about positioning in tech stocks in particular. Right now saying it is so bullish that any sell-off could actually trigger a wider route, with the analysts noting the Nasdaq short bets, they've basically been completely cleared. Let's dig into what is a concern for the broader market. Daffa Tangler Investment CIO, Nancy Tangler, who we love having on because your micro detail about individual companies, their leaders, but also the macro impact of tech right now. Are you worried about any jitters and what that might mean for the S&P and broader benchmarks? Caroline, I, I don't think I'm a perma bull. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years, and there are plenty of times when you want to hedge your portfolios or get out. But I don't think this is one of them. And I think you use weakness uh, in some of these names if there is a sell-off. And there, we'll get a correction, and that will be healthy for the market. And I think then you want to add to names that you either don't own or you don't think you own a not enough of. You heard the Palantir. I mean, you just had a great interview on Palantir. Um, that, that was an extraordinarily bull bullish report for the monetization of generative AI. So the naysayers have been have been fleeing the tech trade for the last four years that I can remember. Uh, it might be actually even longer. And every time technology comes back, and we've talked about how they're the new defensive names, because they generate reliable earnings growth. And we've seen that again this earnings season. What's been interesting is perhaps some of the companies that have outperformed that we finally get to understand where AI fits into their business model. And one that you haven't liked has been Mark Zuckerberg's meta. Remind us of why and why perhaps, you know, are you changing your tune since the mega rally come Friday? No. Um, I mean, we've owned it in the past and we've made a lot of money on the stock and we got out in the high 300s a, while, a couple of years back. Um, I, and, you know, I've been wrong on that, but there there are other places where we've put our, our clients' money and those have been maybe, um, maybe not quite as good or in some cases better. But I just don't like the two-share structure. I don't like the business model. Um, and, and, you know, and I've been wrong. So it's an advertising company for sure. Uh, they are going to adapt and adopt uh, AI, and that will probably continue to drive margins. Um, but we just, there's better places in our view. So that's where we've been hiding out. Okay, so what would Meta and Zuckerberg have to do to change your mind? Well, I think I think for now we've missed it, Ed. And uh, so I love the dividend um, and whether or not it was self-serving. I think he, he keeps about $700 million a year from the dividend. I love the notion of it. And I, I think Google should be paying attention. Amazon, which is a free cash flow um, horse or tank, however you want to characterize it. But uh, in terms of meta, I just I think we've missed it. So it would have to come down from a valuation standpoint. And we would need to see um, continued monetization across their platforms. Uh, but, you know, listen, he's done a great job. And there's no disputing it. Nancy, there are a few things as romantic and poetic as the Bloomberg Markets Wrap headline, which reads, Wall Street on hold as traders await more Fed speak, the inspiration <laughs> and energy in the market. But it reminds us, are we, forget all of the, the AI stuff, we're still waiting on the Fed, right? I think, 
I think the market is beginning to not listen to the Fed. Um, and the reason I say that, Ed, is if you go back and, and look at, at Chairman Powell's comments, historically, he has, he has been adamant about, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates. We won't raise 75 basis points. We're going to stay higher for longer. And each time he made those statements, he reversed himself a short time later. So I think what the market is seeing is, A, um, it, we, we may or may not get a, a cut in March, but we will get cuts this year. Uh, I think that the market is willing to coexist as we did in the 90s, and I've talked about that on your show, with higher interest rates because they're not debilitating. And we've seen that. I mean, for the large tech companies, higher interest rates have actually been um, augured well to their balance sheet. They've uh, grown cash because of the higher interest they're receiving on cash. So I, I think that the market is saying, okay, uh, productivity is improving. Uh, there is a tight labor market. And again, that's going to continue to benefit technology companies. The Fed matters less and less each day that goes by, in my view. Nancy Tangler of Laffer Tangler Investments. Great to catch up. Great to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Now, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, WeWork co-founder Adam Newman and capital providers, including Dan Loeb's Third Point, are working together to explore an offer to buy the co-working firm out of bankruptcy, according to a letter sent to WeWork's lawyers. I, I did just say that, and we will discuss it next, Caro. Uh, deja vu. Adam Newman again. Meanwhile, let's have a little look at what's happening with Hertz, because actually, we we're now trading higher on the, of course, juggernaut for car rental. We're up some 9%. We had dipped into the red earlier because they massively missed in terms of their overall earnings per share. It loss adjusted $1.36 per share is what they got. But why? Because they're selling down, they're offloading those 20,000 Tesla EVs, about one third of its overall electric fleet. But for now, investors starting to see some opportunity as to how they cut costs going forward. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, time for talking tech. And first up, potential investors in Elon Musk's artificial intelligence startup XAI are focusing in on two key selling points. Access to Musk's array of companies, also known as the Musconomy, and the early success of a titan in the space, OpenAI. A slide deck that circulated among potential XAI investors in December and January prominently features both Musk's track record and OpenAI, including a slide showcasing, quote, the key attributes that drove OpenAI's success. More coming. Plus, the newly released Apple and Vision Pro headset is presenting some customer service snags for users. If a Vision Pro owner forgets their passcode, the only way to get the device working again is by bringing it to an Apple store or mailing it to Apple Care customer support. Apple would then erase and reset it. And WeWork co-founder Adam Newman is teaming up with capital providers, including Dan Lowe third point to explore an offer to buy the co-working firm out of bankruptcy. That according to a letter sent to WeWork's lawyers. Newman and third point have been trying to get the information necessary to formulate a bid, which would be for the entire company or its assets back since September. December, sorry, Cara. And we are going to dig into this more because it's not the first time that Adam Newman's wanted to ride to the rescue on this. Mark Millian joins us now for more on the story. And actually, like late 2022, who was trying to make bids to, to basically resuscitate this company he was so associated with. Yes, so apparently there's been a lot happening behind the scenes that hasn't been too deeply reported on, but Newman just like can't let go of this old uh, company that he started. Um, so it's like we're maybe going to get We Crash Season 2, Adam Newman coming back. It'll be fun. So, so yeah, as you mentioned, he, uh, he apparently made a bid in 2022, according to his letter. He most recently offered another sort of like bankruptcy financing offer, um, and now he's teaming up with other uh, financiers to make a, a big, bid maybe to buy the whole company. Um, he hasn't been too specific, but he says he's frustrated because the company is not taking him seriously, not giving him the information that he wants. Mark Millian sharing his idea of fun with, with the millions of viewers. Uh, what is WeWork? The, what it is now and what they, if they save it, hope to make it into? WeWork is in bankruptcy. It's deep in debt. Uh, they can't pay their bills. They're renegotiating with uh, their landlords. WeWork is in deep, deep trouble. 
Um, and for a lot of people, WeWork is Adam Newman, which is why in some ways this does make sense. I mean, he, he deserves much of the credit for driving the company into the ground, which is why he was kind of pushed to step down in 2019. But the last few years, it's been a tough, it's been a tough economy for a real estate business, for a commercial real estate business in particular. So I don't know that Adam Newman would have been able to lead WeWork out of the crisis that it went through in the pandemic. But what is WeWork without Adam Newman? Can, can most people even like, name the, the last couple CEOs of the company? Um, and so maybe, maybe this does make sense. Maybe this is WeWork's last shot, and maybe they should take him seriously. At least that's what he's arguing to the company. All right, Bloomberg's Mark Millian on the what next for WeWork. We'll keep tracking it. Another top story, NVIDIA and Cisco are teaming up to help companies build in-house AI computing in an attempt to push the tech beyond the big data center providers. Cisco is going to offer NVIDIA-based equipment popular for developing AI models along with its own networking gear. And herein lies the story. Forget H100. There are other things, Ethernet cables, other server design components that go into all of this. And Cisco's been saying for a little while, we will get some of this. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. What Cisco is really offering here more than anything else for NVIDIA is a sales force. NVIDIA doesn't have a channel into this world of companies, of, of corporate data centers, of all of these small to medium all the way up to large companies that you know, want to perhaps get in on the AI game, want to perhaps put their own hardware in place, but just have no real way of, of doing that. And that's what Cisco can offer for NVIDIA here, or at least that's the plan. The, the NVIDIA processors go into the M7, um, but if you look at where NVIDIA sells to, the cloud providers, it's kind of shifting some spend, basically. Well, they're trying to, right? I mean... Not a done deal, yeah. Tremendous success with the cloud providers, and that's absolutely wonderful. You know, it's, it's driven their sales to, you know, unprecedented levels, and it's great, but it's already 40% of their revenue. There's a risk there. I mean, what are Microsoft, what are Amazon, what are Google doing? They're making their own chips. Clearly, they know the importance of these things and want to do it themselves. They don't want to be beholden. All right, Bloomberg's Ian King, thank you. Well, the election, with Nevada holding its state-run Democratic and Republican primaries today, the U.S. election is on everyone's mind, including Meta's. The tech giant will begin labeling more posts that were created using AI tools as part of a broader effort to prevent misinformation and deception from spreading on the platforms Facebook, Instagram, and threads during what is a critical election year. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner. And Kurt, this morning you, you did an interview with Nick Clegg at Meta. And, and I guess the question around Meta is always whether that one definitive policy or point of technology is going to fix all of this, which we know uh, the issue is the, the spread of misinformation. Yeah, and, and I think the easy answer is that no, right? There's never going to be a single solution to a problem, especially one as complicated as AI-generated content. And while Meta is trying to you know, push forward into digital watermarking and metadata, right? So if you create an AI-generated uh, photo or video um, using Meta's tools or even some others in the industry, Google, OpenAI, others like that, there's going to be these sort of invisible markers on that content that then Meta can use to sort of label it. But, you know, bad actors aren't going to follow those rules, right? They're going to figure out ways to try and get around these watermarks, uh, to try and get around this metadata because they're out to cause chaos. And so I think Nick Clegg, to his credit, acknowledged that this is not a one-size-fits-all solution, but it is better than, than nothing for them. And of course, Nick Clegg, so integral to these sorts of conversations, having had his own role in politics in the UK for so long before right. coming on to Meta. I'm interested in what he had to say, particularly around the recent audio doctoring of Biden ahead of the primaries. That seems to have been a real catalyst for worrying about AI around elections. He seemed almost relatively optimistic, right? Yeah, I was surprised. I, one of the questions I was most eager to ask him was, you know, how big of a deal is this going to be for the 2024 U.S. election, right? We're all sort of bracing for this inevitable moment where one of the, the candidates has a deep fake of them that, that goes viral online and, and it harms their campaign. And, and Clegg was not nearly as concerned as I thought he would be. And most of that is because he's like, everyone is already looking for this stuff, right? The minute that this happens, the minute that, you know, Joe Biden is, is seen in a deep fake, his campaign is going to raise the alarm. They're going to call Meta. They're going to call the press. And so his sort of feeling was like there's so many people paying attention right now compared to years past that he doesn't actually anticipate this is going to be as big of an issue as I think a lot of other people, other people worry about. 
Mm, how refreshing, some optimism, Kurt Wagner. <laughs> we thank you so much coming to us from Denver. Meanwhile, well, let's talk more about potential threats and indeed some of the benefits, the way in which AI technologies might be a solve and play a role across the year of global election cycles. Christopher Olberg's with us. He's CEO of threat intelligence cloud platform Recorded Future. Christopher, your expertise here, let's just, just dwell on what we were hearing from Kurt. The fact that there's some optimism, that everyone's focused on it, so we won't be able to have this sort of level of misinformation and deep fakes that we're worried about. Do you agree? Yeah, no, first of all, I love optimism, just to be clear, so that's good. Uh, and second, you know, the amazing thing is that we're actually are sort of able to collect all this data. We can organize it, we can analyze it, and we can sort of look for what's anomalous, the stuff that does stand out. And I think it's fair fair to say that the, the sort of the big things, you know, if somebody does that deep fake, whether it's Joe Biden or Trump, and, you know, we're going to be able to find that. You may not even need an algorithm, I think it's the real point. I actually worry more about the subtle stuff. when. Mm -hmm. Somebody in a sub district in Ohio somewhere that is the place which is actually going to make the difference whether an election goes left or right, where somebody may not even have to introduce fake stuff, but they just need to manipulate the actual news stream of actual events happening. There's much more subtle manipulation that I think we need to watch for. And these big deep fakes, that will be sorted. I don't worry too much about that. So let's okay, hypothesize. It seems to be pretty good. Teflon wise anyway, so. I mean, Christopher, hypothesize, you know, there's a manipulated photo of the local polling station where you might go and cast your vote. These sorts of more intricate, smaller scale, issues that really impact certain moves within certain states and geographies then how, how do we as a nation give the average consumer confidence that they're not being manipulated so I think that's going to take a long time. This is not going to happen overnight. The good news is that, you know, when we heard Paul Nocasona from NSA, who just stepped down from NSA, say the other day that, look, the, the sort of his view was that our election as we come into 2024 is going to be the safest on record. So that's good to hear. Now, it's an interesting year. The U.S. has a big election. There's you can count 20, you can actually count 40 major elections in the world around, you know, sort of here, you know, in the full year, uh, UK, Singapore, or Indonesia, India, wherever you want to go, there's big elections. So I don't think we're going to get confidence on this in the short order. It, there's ways we can deal with these problems, but it's going to, the cat is out of the bag. And I think it's going to take some time before we can get back to a place of confidence. It's not going to happen overnight. The challenge here is the same as we see in the cybersecurity context, that there is access to artificial intelligence technology for defense, and the threat actors have access to the same artificial intelligence technology. In the context of this election, how do you feel about who has the balance of competence of how to use it, the threat actors or companies like yours who aim to help uh, fight back and prevent things uh, spreading like AI generated content. So, so first of all, the good news is the United States have the best AI technology in the world. I think we've actually done work in our, in our own analysis here at Recorder Future where we've gotten our hands on the sort of tip top best uh, Russian and Chinese AI and, and you know, using whatever methods, uh, we'll leave it at that, to get our hands on it and playing with it and, you know, doing all kinds of interesting stuff with it. It's not as good as what we have here. So the good news is the US is ahead and it's important that we keep being ahead. And I think there is incredible, there are incredible ways that we can apply this sort of intelligence to be able to discern uh, malicious information, among other things. So, so there's great ways we can help with that. And to your point, it's no different with sort of general cybersecurity, general intelligence, and what we're talking about here in this information. But we're going to have to keep investing. We're going to have to be aggressive. We have to be careful so that we don't put big regulatory stamps or stops in, in the way of staying ahead. Again, the U.S. Right. has a head of Europe because of regulatory sort of being a little bit more permissive over here. So we have a lot of good news for us. We've got to keep that. Christopher Alberg, CEO of Recorded Future. We appreciate the optimism on this show. Thank you. Now, coming up, we're going to discuss all things European venture capital with Hector Mason from Episode One Ventures. Tune in for that conversation. Cara, what are you looking at? Actually, looking across to Japan and Nintendo. 
has raised its forecast for the Switch console. Ed, sales, they think they're going to have 15 nice. and a half million, in fact, for this particular year, the fiscal year. The profit, actually, is therefore going to be on the higher end of expectations. It looks as though their holiday quarter was pretty good. Customised additions, in fact, to the Switch, featuring Super Mario and Animal Crossing themes. They really helped lift the sales of the Japanese market above expectations more broadly. Take a look at the latest in the venture capital world over in Europe. Episode One Ventures, one of Europe's leading early stage funds, is launching a £76 million fund, their third, to invest in B2B software. Let's chat through all of it with Hector Mason, general partner over at Episode One Ventures. And we're interested, Hector, in particularly some of your cornerstone investors. Not only do you take money from seasoned founders in and of themselves, some, some great companies that were well known, but also the UK government backed money. Think of British Patient Capital, in particular National Security Strategic Investment. Fund. What is it that they want to see grown in Europe and in the UK more broadly? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. So um, we have been around for a while and we've built a, a really loyal following um, in our investor base. And so um, for a fund like ours, we're a B2B software fund um, investing at pre-seed and seed stage companies, largely based over here in the UK with checks of between £300,000 and about £3 million. Um, it's really important to build that diversity among your LP base. So um, yes, we have institutional investors who backed us fund after fund. Um, but as you mentioned, we also have this fantastic group of highly successful entrepreneurs, including the founders of many unicorn businesses, um, who have chosen to trust us with some of their money in this latest fund. Um, and they come in alongside those larger investors who are investing in us um, really to ensure that the UK continues to deliver uh, outstanding technology on a, on a global stage. Hey, to how, how would you summarize then the kind of early stage environment right now in the UK? Particularly interesting that you are talking pre-seed, right? Um, that that you, you seem to specialize in, the, in this area where you can write a small check, but many of those portfolio companies do actually go on to raise at higher levels. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're specialists at pre-seed and, and seed, and so we're investing at the very earliest stages into what are initially fledgling startups, and um, we hope and we've seen that many of those uh, go on to become uh, large companies with many hundreds or even thousands of employees. Um, and so the, the, the reason that we invest in, at this stage is um, that there are fantastic returns available, and you get in at the ground floor of these companies, um, and you can see them progress and go on their journeys to um, successful outcomes. And actually, we've seen a 75% graduation rate in our portfolio where companies go on to raise successful Series A rounds of funding, um, which is about almost four times as high as the market average. What's interesting is this comes at a time where the UK has very much been trying to put itself front and centre when it comes to AI. We think of the AI summit late last year. I'm looking at Robin AI among your portfolio companies, a company we've spoken to, the leader of that business, and, and clearly applying artificial intelligence in the legal frame of, of applications. There is some interesting views out there in the UK at the moment that there should be more of an impetus to regulate and the UK government isn't getting ahead of this. What have you made of the UK government saying, look, we're just waiting and we're watching and we're talking to civil society and, and entrepreneurship in the country more broadly? Yeah, look, it's a great question. And um, there's a lot happening in that space around AI regulation. And um, we actually have a couple of AI PhDs on our team here at episode one. And so we have a natural interest in the space. And it's really important that people are developing these technologies with an eye on um, being responsible. And so we love companies like Robin AI, and we have many other AI companies in the portfolio who are able to um, build real defensibility around their businesses. And um, whether that's through proprietary data data that other people would find it very hard to access um, so that they can train models that are highly effective and um, can outcompete um, other players in the market or actually just more generally companies using AI as part of their existing SaaS tool to make their products better for their customers. We also really like companies that are using um, AI to help enterprise adoption and speed up that, that process. But you're absolutely right. A lot of focus needs to be placed on how we can do this responsibly. Um, and we're pleased to see that the portfolio is taking, taking responsibility there and, and being cautious around rolling out the technologies. Hector Mason, General Partner, Episode 1 Ventures. Great to have some of your time from the UK. We don't often talk about that UK market just in isolation. Really interesting conversation.
A new AI company wants to tackle a niche problem in retail, finding a home for returned inventory that would otherwise be gathering dust. The company called Vended It is billionaire John Paul DeJoria's latest venture and delighted to say he joins us right now on Bloomberg Technology. Uh, this, is, this is interesting. If I return any good, it'll end up in a warehouse somewhere, JP. Yep. And, and there is a market for that. There are discounters. There are retailers that are looking for that, that big volume of used or returned inventory. But it takes Sorry. a long time to get hold of it. Just explain the point behind Vendidic. Oh, you would, would love to, okay? By the way, it's bigger than people know. One in six of most retail products are returned. One in six. It's a trillion dollar business. About three years ago, it was around 300, I think, 50, 80 million dollars. This year, it'll be a trillion dollar business. And what happens is this. People buy things. Manufacturers overload things, okay? And then what do they do with it? Sitting in warehouses, which cost money. Trucks go back and forth. So what we've put together here is a special platform that costs the manufacturer or, of course, our clients nothing to implement as well as use. But what it does is it connects the seller and the buyer or manufacturer instantaneously right there instead of sitting around in a warehouse for weeks and being shuffled around. Now, it also eliminates landfills because we have to renew logic, one of our offshoots of our company, where we redo everything. So it eliminates the yes. landfills or sitting around. But also this, it eliminates tens of thousands of trucks hauling stuff back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then what's there on the shelf, it gives the person that has it, whether it's a manufacturer that we deal with or the retailer we deal with, the highest value and highest return instantly, where they go directly to the second person who buys it. So what we do is our software, our AI, takes on our platform, it takes it from the person that has it, whether it be the manufacturer yes. or the wholesaler, and sends it out to, through our implementation, all these various people, thousands of them everywhere, that are the actual buyers, it puts them in touch. So you take something that's worthless and you make it valuable. And so that, that's pretty good. You know, that's pretty good. You get uh, something rid of it instantly instead of in weeks. Here's what I want to understand. We know you as, as the founder of Paul Mitchell and later, yeah. if you don't mind me saying, you built a lot of your wealth on the sale of Patron to Bacardi. Yes, Patron. Excellent. Patron Tequila. How, di how did you end up in, in an AI company? Well, being into the environment and helping out what's best I can industry with it, I got involved many years ago, seven, eight years ago, with Renew Logic. It was a company that part of my family and dear friends put together that I got involved with. And what it did was it took things out of closets, out of warehouses, things that were electronic things, that, for example, to start with their telephones, that had to be disassembled, the important parts that could be reusable, taken out, and the rest destroyed ecologically, instead of hiding in a landfill or destroying the earth. So I was already into it. The next step would be, now how do we take that to the next step? How do we make it more, shall we say, valuable to some of our customers to actually move their goods instantly? And that's what we worked on. I spent millions of dollars putting this together in the AI with some of the greatest people. Gary, for example, is one of the best in the world. He's one of the main guys that are there and one of our partners. And uh, Gary Stevens just a genius at what he does. Yeah. But anyway, so we took that and great people and put it together. And I thought, it's the world needs us. The world needs to clean up the oceans. We need to clean up the landfills. We need to save using trucks where you don't have to and using people we don't have to repetitiously. So it makes the business shorter, quicker, and much more valuable. JP, and I'm all about fewer moving parts. Why do you think this hasn't been solved already? It's not niche. You just articulated the trillion of, of dollars of value. Yeah. Why hasn't someone done this? Well, people have done it before, but in various segments. What we do with our AI is we put it all together. So instead of going to from the manufacturer or the wholesaler to a middleman into a warehouse and then to try and get it out to various customers they can get out to, we go directly to the customer. So we have that. No one's ever put that together before. We do have that. And it affects many, many industries. And we're here, even our competitors, it helps our competitors out because it helps them move out things also a lot quicker. And we're, we're all working with them also. So everybody wins. That's how America works. And America still works, by the way. America still works, and it's still the land of opportunity. We are an optimistic show today, and we're loving it. JP, from your perspective, who do you sign on? How many clients have you already got in, already on the platform? Because you're coming out of stealth. 
I think the best way to do it is this. We went from one person getting involved in taking orders now, and we're going to be at the big show that's going on in Las Vegas, as you know, this week. I'm the keynote speaker there. To 17 people, from 1 to 17, just to implement it. We have people standing by for this right now. We have a few we've already implemented, but uh, there's, there's, quite, there's quite a few. I want to say it'll end up, once we're done with the show, probably thousands, because nobody has this. And it's an answer to a big question and a big challenge that manufacturers and retailers have had. Move it out, and also they get top value for their dollar. So instead of having to discount it all the way down, and maybe at the end make no money, just move it out, right? Yeah. They actually get the top value out of it the way we do it. We eliminate the middleman. Jean-Paul de Joria, it's been great having some time with you. Co-founder of pleasure. Men Did It. Go you got to it. Peace, love, and happiness. <laughs> and to you. Thank you. Meanwhile. You betcha. Peace, love, and happiness at the end of the edition of this Bloomberg Technology Ed. It's been a broad-ranging conversation, and we're still looking at the companies that are set to have earnings after the bell today. Yeah, and uh, there's some optimism going into some of those earnings, and there is some less than optimism on others. Don't forget, recap the show on the podcast. Wherever you're getting your podcast, we're posting on the Bloomberg platforms, but also Apple, Spotify, and iHeart. And we really appreciate it. Everyone give us a lot of feedback about the, about the podcast, Caro, because they might watch the show in that form, listening in on their way to work. From New York City and San Francisco, this is me leaving you with a smile and some optimism, and this is Bloomberg Technology.